People come to me and ask me like, Trios, why are you still doing Ovid's Crystal videos? Why are you just not moving on and doing more montages of different videos and all that stuff? And I just look at the comments I get underneath my videos, right? And I see this. I see just this and I'm like, come on. Why should I stop doing Crystal videos if you guys want them so much? If you guys appreciate them so much? So I will continue doing Crystal videos, but I will still do my other types of videos. But keep in mind that these kinds of comments are definitely what keeps me motivated to do, uh, to do like all these videos that I'm doing. And I really appreciate you. Thanks a ton. But uh, without further ado, let us go into this video. And well, hello everyone, it's Katrius here, and I welcome you to this new video. And today I want to talk to you guys about the Crystron deck and how it has performed in order to be viable or successful in certain events which you want to play. Because this is something people have been curious about for a pretty long time already, and I was like, mm, I could deliver, but let's just do it, I guess. So I have two lists prepared for you one is my own list, and the other one is the list that when third place in the Swedish regional. If you haven't seen a video um, containing that list already, Glasgow Yu-Gi-Oh! was uploading it uh, a while ago and I just copied the list from there. I will link this uh, the video down in the description so you can watch that video as well. He doesn't have too much too much insight into the crystal archetype but he tries to show it I, I hope because I haven't watched the video I just copied the list. However, back to topic. We are talking about crystals and how it has to perform in order to be successful, which means that we have to look at the matchups, at the current meta matchups, and the most things we will most likely see are zodiacs, more zodiacs, maybe some infernoids, maybe some witch edelon artifacts, maybe some paleozoics, and all that kind of stuff. So we have to look at exactly those matchups and how they, uh, how we perform against them. And let's just start with the biggest thing, which is Zodiax. Zodiax are pretty, um, pretty plus heavy. They make a lot of one card, which is both a good and a bad thing, because one card combos are of course strong. The more you can get from one card, the better it is, because you still have four cards in your hand. But the downside to that is that if you disrupt that one card really hard, the opponent is a little bit screwed because his opponent, uh, his um, options are a lot more weakened. So this deck, Crystrons, already has a kind of good matchup against Zodiax if going first, because we can just wipe out our uh, our standard field of C3, uh, Scrap Recycler, and a Set Impact with Preziorl in the graveyard in order to go for Trishula as soon as Zodiac Redpear hits the field which is always a great thing. So we can definitely banish just the first red peer out of the game and we will never see it again. And if he normally summons the red peer, we even get rid of the Zodiac combo of the graveyard, which is even better. Just remember that you should not... Um, that you should not uh, like chain Quan decks to an effect if you are going to summon stuff like Trishula or Black Rose Ring, because those are when effects and when effects are missing their timing if they're not summoned uh, in uh, channeling one because this is an external special summon and external special summons just work, work like that you have to be a uh, chaining one in order to win effects not missing timing so keep that in mind please but yeah as i said uh, zodiacs are really, really 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 vulnerable to this kind of stuff however in the tcg we still see some kaiju variant although the pure build is slightly getting bigger and bigger so we already also have to be prepared for kaijus which is a very very hard thing for this deck which is because uh, which is the reason why i am um running free mask of restrict in the side deck because i bet you were wondering when you looked at this list why i have these mask of restricts these are for kaijus because kaijus tribute and if you can tribute you're out we don't tribute we destroy so this is great um the, the biggest downside of this deck is if you if you get a kaiju on your tuner you're dead you're just pretty much dead especially against zodiacs because zodiacs can otk from that point you can however work against a slumber to and just by making a synchro and the synchro is getting destroyed and floats into the Zolfafnir from the graveyard, which floats again into another card from the deck, which is a great thing. 
So this deck has very versatile methods to go uh, against that. However, just just a pure kaiju will uh, fuck you around because it will just tribute your tuner if your opponent is good and you're out of the game. What else does uh, hit Zodiacs though? If you go, don't go first and happen to have Ghost Oak Ray in your hand, you can just use the Ghost Oak Ray on um, Mom Red's Normal Summon or the Barrage because that hits the opponent pretty much. I don't think any Zodiac player at this point is still de detaching the Marmorad in order to uh, special summon the Marmorad. He's just going for uh, Marmorad still sitting on the Xyz materials and stuff. But most of the time you just want to disrupt the Marmorad field effect or barrage in order to make the opponent use more resources, which is a very important thing because our deck works to get rid of opponents' resources. What else can you do against Zoodiax? Siding wise, a lot actually. Siding wise, we can side in two dark holes because they are really, really vulnerable to field removal because they don't have like innate protection or floating capabilities. So, it's, so dark hole and Raigeki are both good cards. I'm not using Raigeki because I don't have it. I could afford it, but I'm just too lazy to order a Raigeki at this point. So I am just using the two dark holes because it doesn't really hit me as uh, anyways. You can also go for two ED crows. So when a Marmorad hits the graveyard, you can just banish that Marmorad. So that makes up for at least two banished Marmorads. So the engine is pretty much dead if you have two banished Marmorads. What you can do as well is Flying Sea. However, Flying Sea is very vulnerable to Zodiac Barrage, and everyone is playing Zodiac Barrage. So. Uh, huh. You have to chain it on the summon of Zodiac Barrage in order for it to be most efficient, but you will you will see what I mean, I guess. So that covers the Zodiac matchup to, to a degree because, well, we have a lot of side options against it and especially in my build, I have a lot of cards I can actually side out, like Upstart Goblin, Terraforming, both of the different Dimension Deep Sea Trenches, like that, that helps a lot. So. TLDR against Zodiac, pressure with hand traps like Ghost Orchid, Snow Rabbit and Maxi or uh, try to wipe the field with stuff like Dark Hole or just try to lock them with banishing all the Marmorads with DD Crow Trishula or just stopping them from going for XZ summons with Flying C. That's basically all. Alright, next up is the Infernoid matchup and that's the matchup I hate the most because of Void Feast. Void Feast makes this matchup really, really hard to uh, to get over with because they just summon two Decatron and a I don't know they have a six one yeah uh, the two uh, Decatron just sent in like Deviati or Ununku and they have a lot of negates on the field which you can't get over it anymore so you have to open against Infernoids at any time and my personal th uh, thoughts are. You either have to have Maxi out or Valor out against a Decatron or um, Lancia in order to them not being able to banish anymore. Because otherwise I don't really see how we can destroy them. Um, you also should side in the Twin Twisters if you go first in the next game. Because you can just pop their sets because they most likely set two things like Void Seer and Void Madness or Void, void whatever and Void Madness. So you can just pop two cars mostly and that's great because Void Madness still, uh, Void Feast I mean, still needs one phase up Void card to be able to be activated. So if you pop them before he can activate it, he is pretty much screwed at that point because the deck mostly reveals, uh on that. So Lancia and Twin Twister are both very good cards and sometimes AD Crow does the job as well. But other than that I don't really see how I personally can beat Inferno is that hard. So Inferno is a really hard matchup of a stack in my opinion. Going into Wind Witch Adelon Artifact or Wind Witch Invoked Artifact which is the name now in the TCG, this is a lot easier actually because well first thing you can do is Trishula the Ice Bell. Second thing you can do is just Ghost Oak Rivia Alistar which doesn't do that much so just don't. But what I would do is side out the Ghost Ogres. Yep. I would side up your Ghost Ogres against uh, Wind Witch Adelon Artifact and I would side in the uh, Effect Vader so you Vader the Alistar which 
does a little more because, well, most people are only running two invocations because there is no reason to run three if you have a searcher for a searcher for a searcher for an invocation. So that covers that. So you just vein him the Alistar and hope that he doesn't have one of his two invocations on your hand. So yeah, that that is great. Um, for the artifact part, the artifacts don't hit us too much anyways because we're going to summon the most in the opponent's turn. We don't really need access to our extra deck in our own turn. So that's great, right? I think that's great. So we can just go out with our plays and make our plays in the opponent's turn. Artifacts cannot resolve in, the, uh, in your own turn. So uh, I mean, if you're playing artifacts, you cannot resolve your uh, artifact effects in your own turn. So Scythe will be pretty much useless and Moral Attack will be annoying. But Moral Attack is limited so it will be just annoying once and then just disappear forever. So that's a great thing. Siding wise, as I said I would go with Effect Vader and stuff like DD Crow. If he goes for the Wonder One stuff, so Alistair to Invocation, Wonder One, uh, Tribute Bow, Draw 2. Then just banish the Alistar with DD Crow and you'll be fine. Otherwise, I can also see siding in Valencia because uh, he has to banish from the graveyard um, or the field most of the time to, in order to summon stuff of invocation, so that helps. And yeah, that's basically it. So now we have covered uh, what, I, what my deck can do against those archetypes. And I also have a regional Christron deck from the Swedish regional and whatever I cannot pronounce or remember the name of a of a place that happened so let's just look at this list so this list is basically capitalizing on a lot of weaknesses of other decks we have seven mill cards three Genex undying three scrap recyclers and mathematician in order to get our frogs into the graveyard uh, our Ronin totem into the graveyard or self into the graveyard like everything we need however if you look at the extra deck, this deck doesn't really go too much into Crystron plays because we only have one Quan Dex, one Armatrix, one Phoenix, we don't even run Quarian Gundrex, which I can understand because Quarian Gundrex is not that awesome in this current state of the game. Trishula is a lot better for us. However, uh, I would still go for a Quarian Gundrex. This Phoenix is most likely because um, the Zodiac matchup likes to put a lot of traps and. Um, you wanna banish the Void me uh, void Feast, you wanna banish the Invocations and all that. So, Phoenix doesn't actually make sense. So, no bashing on there. But if you look at this deck closely, you'll see that it mostly capitalizes on going into the dang long um, Nine Branches combo. And if you don't know what that is, is that you summon dang long, you uh, use its effect to dump the Chi Van, and when you set the uh, nine branches you search on, uh, out of Danglong, then if your opponent does anything, you use the nine branches to destroy Danglong and by negate the effect, shuffle that card back into the deck. Then she then triggers and Danglong triggers. Danglong summons the Bian, she then summons itself, and Bian uses its effect and uses them t those two to, in order to summon a Herald of the Arc Light, which is indestructible by battle. So you have another free negate on the field. Which also very very hard, which also hits Infernoids very very hard because stuff like uh, Lawn Mowing Next Door or Grass is Greener and stuff doesn't even work anymore. Like Grass is Greener, Monster Gate, all that kind of stuff is now dead because he ben had to banish all that shit that he would send to the graveyard from the main deck. This is great because this hits uh, those decks a lot. But as you see, this deck really catalyzes on going into the Danglong and the Tree Toad play. So it is not that much Crystron as it should be. I don't understand some card decisions like Coral Drain because you summon Coral Drain really, really rarely. You don't really have a logic behind the Rion that you have here because you don't want to summon Shambara on the opponent's turn. You most likely don't want to even summon Axis Synchron on this build on the opponent's turn. Because you cannot really use it unless you use it with Herald of the Arclight, which I highly doubt, in order to go for Crystal Phoenix. So you only have the Armatrix, which you can summon very easily off a C3 because you have 7 mill cards. Yep. What I am definitely missing in this build is a Crystal Wing, because you will have the controller on the hand. 
and you won't use most of your, of your normal summons. So you could normal summon controller, use a level 5 synchro and just go for the crystal wing because, well, he is running an Omega but he is not running crystal wing which is really really surprising in my opinion. I will basically drop the Crowder Dragon for a crystal wing and just go with that. Maybe he doesn't have a crystal wing though so that's alright as well. For his side deck he decided to go for Psyfer and Lodella in order to, like, I, I believe in order to negate the invocation. Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit for the obvious things, Chaos Hunter for the obvious things. Um, it also helps by filling our graveyard, so this is not bad. Forbidden Ap Apocrypha because this is pretty good against Zodiacs, I believe. Yeah, this is good against Zodiacs. Torrential Tribute because Field Wipes and Anti Spell Fragrance against the so against some of the uh, last remaining. Um, Pendulum decks. He also main decks Forbidden Chalice and Book of Moon, which are both great cards in the current meta. Especially Book of Moon against Red Pier is really, really hard. So that's always great. But now I want to show a comment from Glasgow Yu Gi Oh's video, which states why I think that this list is not really uh, showing us anything we have to acknowledge because this comment. Hi there, Swedish player here. Most of our regionals get, a, get like a maximum of 30 players, usually like 20. Everyone plays either free time structure deck, meta decks or rogue. Hope this will help people understand a little more on how our meta looks like. So what does this tell us really? This tells us that this deck is not really meant to be put up against the meta decks because stuff like Zodiac, stuff like with which Adolin Artifact is not going to happen in Sweden that much because they're just using met, uh, Structure Deck, Meta Decks or Rogue. So this is more like against the ABC matchup with Chaos Hunter and all that and against the DDD stuff I guess. So this is not really showing us anything. Like any spell fragrance if this build is most likely against DDD in order to uh, prevent him from using his um, contracts that easily. Same goes for Forbidden Chalice because you can just negate the cat with it. Same goes for Ghost Ogre because you can just negate the um, contracts again. Chaos Hunters again against DDD and ABC and stuff. Delta is against DDDs a lot and ABCs. So it looks like this deck is mostly built to go against DDD and ABC or other rogue decks, which this deck has not really a problem against. So I think that this deck doesn't show us anything at how crystals have to perform in order to be good at, the, uh, at certain events. However, this deck still does a good job at showing how we can deal with Zodiacs because of the card options uh, shown in this deck. I personally don't like this deck and I'm, I am questioning some of the card decisions, but this deck is by no means a shitty list. This is just not an unoptimal list. So keep that in mind. Crystal list can of course defer, and they have to defer because we're all different players. But I think that a 48 Yangzing Crystron deck, or I don't even want to call this Yangzing Crystron because it's just a Crystron deck that tags the Yangzing engine. So I don't think that this is the most optimal build to go on regionals with, but this, is, this looks like a really, really fun build, and the card ratios of Crystrons are all, also mostly on point in my opinion. In the 48 deck, uh, card deck I can also see a triple Sylphavni to be honest. So I think I just talked for like a 19 minutes, so I think I should free you from his suffering right now. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, like. I appreciate all your comments, like, I, I can show them again, like, all these comments are making me so motivated to do this more and more. I am so happy to have a community, like, uh, of you guys, because you're making me so motivated to make more Chris Run videos. Chris Run is what makes, what made my channel explode, and it is also my favorite deck of all time. I'm just now sitting, just, do you hear this? This is my deck box. If this deck box, this list you uh, can barely see now because of the comments, let me just get rid of those and move this here. Uh, this list is in this deck box. So, 
This is my very, very favorite deck. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys will enjoy my future videos and stay Raven.